You're listening to Natural Resources University. This episode features Working Wild U, hosted by Dr. Jared Beaver and Alex Few. This is not just your little backyard scenario. This is this is open range setting, and we are only have the capacity to to do one side of the calving pasture, which is still a two mile long fence. Every cowboy that we hire, direct cost is about seventy thousand dollars a year minimum. So you said big, seven zero seventy thousand dollars a year. Yeah, six thousand dollars a month. Right now, it's costing us right at about $100 to $110 per carcass. Welcome back to The Working Wild You, a show where we explore what it means to share the working landscape with people and wildlife from the crossroads of culture and science. I'm Jared Beaver. And I'm Alex Spew. In this episode, we're diving into techniques that can help ranchers deal with wolves. What we'll discover is that how these tools are applied has everything to do with how well they work. And applying them? Well, that takes know-how, money, and time, which is why it's so important to find new ways to make these tools more efficient and affordable so we can sustain both wildlife and farms and ranches. This is something that Jared and I are really passionate about. We're part of a diverse team of livestock producers, researchers, extension agents, and NGOs that are engaged in a project funded by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. The goal of this project is to bring resources to private landowners living with expanding predator populations. We hope this project will lead to new cost share opportunities for different types of electric fencing, including turboflagery, range riding, and carcass management. That's right. We chose to focus on these three practices because, as you just heard, they are what livestock producers around the West are most interested in, and there's already some science that points to their usefulness. And coming up, we'll head out to northern Colorado to learn about turboflagery from a rancher right at the edge of an expanding wolf population. Working Wild U is a proud part of Natural Resources University, a podcast network delivering science-based information for your natural resource management. Other current network series include Timber University, Fish University, Deer University, Fire University, and Habitat University. Available wherever you get your podcasts. So I'm here in North Park, Colorado today and I'm here because there's a resident wolf pack that's in the area that moved in about one year ago and has been causing a lot of trouble um been depredating some livestock killing some folks dogs and this has been a big adjustment for livestock producers in Colorado because wolves have not had a presence here in about 100 years that's our show producer Matt Collins so the reason I'm here today is to help Don Gittleson who's a livestock producer install fladry and turbo fladry on his property. Gittleson, who ranches near Walden, experienced Colorado's first wolf-related depredation in nearly a century. And this pack dispersed from northern Wyoming. And so these depredations came on the heels of a ballot initiative to reintroduce wolves to the state of Colorado by 2023. And so to say that these depredations raised the temperature on the topic of wolves, well, that's an understatement. To try to stop the depredations, volunteers gathered to put up a wolf deterrent called turboflagery in Gittleson's calving pasture. If you think about a used car lot and the flags kind of waving in the wind, um, it's not too far off of that. So if you were to put flags onto an electric fence, string it about three feet off the ground, it actually is fairly effective in preventing wolves from crossing that line of fence because wolves are neophobic. Neophobic, that's a fancy way of saying wolves don't like new things. And believe it or not, waving red flags on polywire can be enough to keep wolves at bay. Well, at least for a while. And this isn't new. For centuries, wolf hunters in Eastern Europe used flags attached to ropes or poles to funnel wolves to a specific location. That's an exciting part of this. We're really rediscovering old wisdom and adapting that to working landscapes as predators return. 
Yeah, and Flagery is a good example. The flapping flags are old, the electrified fencing is new, and together they can help producers manage a challenging situation. And so they'll, they'll stay away when Flagery is up for the most part, and if they were to test it, they would get a shock. Um, and so Turbo Flagery can be effective. This is Don Gittleson talking about how wolves responded to Flagery on his property. They went right to it and didn't come across it. And then they moved. They would make a big loop and go out and come back to it and stop, make a big loop and come back to it. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Even when it was on the ground. What's challenging is that the fence can get blown down. Um, wolves can get used to it and then start testing it more frequently. And so this can be a problem. How a tool is implemented is important. Flagery requires regular maintenance or it gets blown down. Research has shown it should only be up for two or three months. If it's up too long, wolves get used to it. It stops being new. So you have to deploy it when livestock are the most vulnerable during calving. All of this management, putting up, taking down, maintaining the fence, that's big effort. We're talking time and money, particularly on the producer side. We'll be going out as a crew. We'll be taking down the T-posts, we'll be spooling up the flagery and putting it in big uh, kind of spools. Think about a garden hose around a spool in your backyard. And then we'll be putting that on the back of ATV, taking it to a new location, repounding those T-stakes, putting in new, um, new stakes to hold up, and then um, stringing the flagery through a new location and then electrifying it. Um, and so, as, as mentioned, this is not just your little backyard scenario. This is, this is open range setting. This, is, this calving pasture is hundreds of acres, and we are only have the capacity to, to do one side of the calving pasture, which is still a two mile long fence. As you can hear, putting up and taking down flattery in large scale range settings is hard work. Also, moving flagery from one pasture to another does not get around the wolf habituation problem and that two to three month time limit. So as Don mentioned, he was seeing results, but he also acknowledges that its usefulness in large landscapes is pretty limited. And that's why most research recommends limiting its use to smaller pastures, 40 acres to not more than 160, which requires up to two miles of flagery. And as you could imagine, that can be quite expensive. It costs about $4,800 per mile of fence, which is why they could only do one side of Gittleson's pasture that day. And without fully enclosing a pasture, well, the effectiveness is going to be reduced. So each conflict prevention practice, whether it be flagery, range riding, or carcass management, is best fit to certain operational contexts. For example, where flagery is impractical, range riding may be more appropriate like on large grazing allotments. And when we come back, we'll hear from folks that are adapting the age-old practice of shepherding livestock or cowboying into what is today often called range riding. Hey, Working Wild, you listeners. We think you'll like another show from the Western Landowners Alliance, the Unland Podcast, a show that features thoughtful conversations with people who are living and working on the land and shaping the future of stewardship in the American West. The On Land Podcast is the audio companion of On Land, the magazine of the Western Landowners Alliance. Check it out at onland.westernlandowners.org and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Before the break, we'd mentioned that we'd be talking about range riding. So range riding is a huge term. It encompasses a lot of things, as we'll hear from ranchers in different parts of the West. Range riding really has been around for millennia. And in the American West, cowboy culture was prominent until fencing and predator eradication became policy, as we explored in episode two. As wolves are returning across the West, so is the cowboy, now called a range rider. I met with Nelson Shirley, a livestock producer in Catron County, New Mexico, and a board member of Western Landowners Alliance. Nelson's ranch has struggled with Mexican gray wolves for some time. And on this cold and windy night, we were checking on his freshly weaned calves, bawling for their mothers. We got wolves either come down that ridge, elk horn will either come down that ridge, 
and come in at a bowl that right in right where we first came through our gate up there. That's the way they Elkhorn always travels when they come in to kill stuff. Elkhorn is the name of the wolf pack that Nelson described. This group of wolves has been attacking cattle on Nelson's ranch for years now. So compared to our ranch operation in Kansas or Missouri, where we don't have any predators, we don't even have to worry about this. So nobody has to get up in the middle of the night and go prowling around. Um, we don't have to have somebody that can hack, you know, as a help, you know, as a floating range rider. they got to be out there day or night to try to solve it. So every cowboy that we hire direct cost is about $70,000 a year, minimum. Did so you said big, seven zero seventy thousand dollars a year? Yeah, $6,000 a month. If you're talking cost of the salary, workers' comp, uh, pickup truck, propane, fuel, you know, hay for horses, all that. Wow, I'm thinking back to episode three, where we learned about the thin profit margins many livestock producers face. These are really significant costs Nelson's talking about here. They really are. And when predators were extirpated from most of the West, the value of the range rider plummeted. Essentially, that cost was eliminated from the price of beef. And now, with Nelson's New Mexico beef competing on a national and international market, with beef from places like Missouri and Kansas, with virtually no predator pressure, he simply can't cover that cost with what he gets paid for his cows. Another really tough thing about losing the cowboy is that there were other benefits, ecological, economic, nutritional, that were lost. More eyes on acres. That makes for better stewardship. Let's head up to Montana to learn about some of those benefits. If I find a place where the wolves are marking by urine, I pee there. And if I find a place where they've defecated, if it's handy, I do that right there on top of it. I want them to know who I am. That's quite the introduction to Chet Robertson, a range rider in Montana's Big Hole Valley. Chet's a character for sure, but he's also a bit of a savant when it comes to protecting livestock from wolves. Chet told us about all the ways he's tapping into wolf behavior to make them just a bit more uncomfortable spending time around livestock. But this isn't your typical Hollywood Western cowboy on AMC. For one, he spends his time on a four-wheeler, not a horseback. And he's usually not with the cows, though he knows where they are. He's using game cameras. He's tracking wolves. Once I've, that first couple, three weeks where I've done research, I'll call it, got as many pictures as I can. I kind of know what I'm dealing with. Then I start doing weird stuff. Um, wolves are very neophobic vary and and I think they can't stand it that I that I'm there all the time that I'm doing weird things that people don't usually do like peeing where they pee and etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I think it just worries the tar out of them so it sounds like he's just out there playing mind games Chet used that fancy word again neophobia the same strategy that Flagger relies on he's experimenting trying different things trying to keep wolves on their toes by, yes, even urinating or defecating where they do. All the while, he's learning as much as he can about these wolves. Years ago, I started experimenting, and I'll, I'll tell one of my first experiments. There was a trail that went from a, a logging road to a creek, a crossing, and this trail about halfway between the road and the creek, the trail split and became two trails, but only for a little bit. It made an island between the two trails, if, if you can picture that. Well, 85% of the time they traveled one of these trails. Well, I got curious about this and I went and I stacked three rocks in the middle of that trail in a position where you could see it from both ends of the trail, see this stack of rocks in the middle of the trail. Well, lo and behold, I come back the next time, the wolves had been down the trail they got to the split in the trail where they could see that stack of rocks and they stopped cold. All animals make some risk first reward calculation. And what's being described here is changing this calculation. You could just see in your mind, they're just they're looking at that stack of rocks and wondering what to do. And, and finally, they went down the other trail. 
and went on their way and life went on as normal. Well, the next time through, I took the stacks of rocks out, but they never went back to that trail. They kept using the other trail. So I went and I put rocks in the other trail and see what they do then. They quit using the trail completely and I lost them. <laughs> I never could find them after that. Um, but th that's an example. It, it, they're so neophobic. Anything that's odd or changed or different, it, they really don't like that. It's really about understanding where predators are on the landscape. And in Chet's case, keeping the wolves uncomfortable around the livestock. I think if they're spending so much time worrying about me and being uncomfortable in their situation, I think that they don't get comfortable enough to where they're snooping around in amongst the cattle. There's there's people there and this guy's always hassling us. And, and I think they're just spending more time on the elk and the deer. During our conversation with Chet, he talked a lot about other tools he uses and the history behind his role in the big hole and how he got started. You can watch the whole thing through a link in the show notes. While Chet has innovated some of his own methods, there are a lot of other producers integrating range riding into their operations in other ways. Chet talks about riding the wolves. Other people talk about riding the herd. And this stock-focused approach has other benefits beyond conflict reduction with wolves. Yeah, a lot of stock-focused range riding benefits herd health. This practice, leading the herd to safe places with the most nutritious forage, can keep the animal stress levels down, letting them focus on eating and gaining weight. Yeah, rather than worrying about predators. So when this form of range riding is working best, it can actually improve range health, including the diversity of plants and the health of the soil. But this stock-focused range riding is not without added time and money. Think about the investments Tom Berkmeyer and Nelson Shirley are making. So livestock producers often need to find funding to offset the cost of working with a range rider. They can't simply roll those costs into the price they charge for their animals. That's where opportunities for cost sharing through NRCS can really come into play. Plus, all these eyes on acres get folks talking and collaborating, whether it be with neighbors or management agencies. There are so many potential benefits of range riding. It can reduce wolf conflicts, it can provide information needed to adapt grazing, to reduce risk, and it can improve rangeland health. The outcomes really depend on how range riding is adapted to fit the context of an operation. In its best use, it's a win-win for wildlife and livestock. When we come back, we'll be traveling to southwest Montana to discuss another tool that's being increasingly installed across communities in the West carcass management. If you're enjoying Working Wild U, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to subscribe to Working Wild U wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Now back to the show. When was the last time any carcasses were added? About a week ago, I think. Last week I did five or six. It's remarkably smell-free. Yeah, not much odor, odor, hardly ever, unless I'm stirring it, it might get a little odor for a day, but that's it. Even in the heat of the summer when it's hot as hot can get? It doesn't get, does not stink for the most part. So every ranch, no matter the quality of care, loses some animals to disease, injury, predation, weather, you name it, there's a lot of forces at play on a ranch. With carcass composting, these decaying wolf or bear magnets are consolidated into a single predator-proof facility. Where they're composted into soil through the power of microorganisms and a little bit of churning and watering. And it doesn't even smell. Well, you can smell it a bit when you're right up close with your toes in the dirt. But even then, it doesn't really smell. I visited a good friend and colleague of ours, Linda Owens, who's the project director for the Madison Valley Ranchlands Group, a rancher-led community organization outside of Ennis, Montana. With the grizzlies and the wolves, and, and even like the coyotes, if we can keep the carcasses cleaned up, let them just eat the wildlife carcasses and the, their general diet, it helps keep them out of trouble and it reduces the conflict. Because ranching is not the it's not the driving force anymore in Montana. 
and we need to try to keep ranchers here. It helps keep the open lands working and it keeps those wildlife with a home base. There's a lot of competing interest in the valley. I mean, recreating in the Madison Valley and the resulting development is the driving force. People from all over the world come to fish the Madison River. And when they come, they want 10 acres of it. And so to help her neighbors, regardless of how long they've lived here, Linda's at the ready, even with her own vehicle. When it's cold out, I don't have any qualms about hauling something on the back of my pickup. When it starts warming up, I have the dump trailer, and then I have a compost mats that I put so that if there's any fluid coming out of the animal that it's soaked up at the back there. So we visit a little bit. They'll cut the tags out or I'll cut the tags out. So this is an important point. Ear tags, plastic, it doesn't compost. And it can reveal sensitive information about ownership. So removing ear tags maintains anonymity. It's been increasing every year, which is, means that the ranchers are buying into the program and that it works. And this is critical to getting a carcass management program off the ground, because really, producers are in the business of keeping their livestock just that, alive. And when stuff goes wrong, you don't want to broadcast it across the community. But as community buy-in increased, the costs increased with it. Right now, it's costing us right at about $100 to $110 per carcass. And that's including Matt burying them and me picking them up. Carcass management facilities require a good deal of resources and coordination with county health boards to get off the ground. Once this is established, there needs to be people like Matt and Linda who can spend their time both picking up carcasses and tending the compost. And if we sound like we're beating a dead horse, no pun intended, capacity needs are ongoing and essential for carcass management programs to work. We're hoping that NRCS will help create cost share opportunities to fund other community programs, like Linda's, who are interested in starting their own carcass management program. And NRCS has already had some success in doing this with another local community group in Montana. Here's Kyle Tackett, the NRCS Assistant State Conservationist for Partnerships. How we look at this is it's not a, a state down approach, top down approach. It's really locally led. And, and I think through our effort over the last couple of years and, and really leaning on partners like the Blackfoot Challenge, um, we've been able to, to work through that and actually get a, get a practice on the ground um, looking at electrified um, grizzly mats. And I think that's being responsive to that locally led process. To learn more about the new practice Kyle is talking about, electrified grizzly mats, check out the really awesome video from the Blackfoot Challenge in the show notes. And these community programs, like the Blackfoot Challenge and the Madison Valley Ranchlands Group, can help connect folks in their area with resources that are much needed to address the many challenges on Western rangelands, whether that be weeds, water, or wildlife. And just like with fencing and range riding, carcass management can be adapted to fit the area. For example, in some states, livestock aren't allowed to be composted, so a pickup program would need to transfer carcasses to a disposal facility. In some large and remote areas, an on-ranch facility might be more feasible. So again, each of the techniques we've described today have their own set of benefits, limitations, and share of unknowns. But one thing that is constant is that context matters. Regardless of the technique, one thing we need to think about is how these practices are being applied within the different regulatory contexts found across the West. This regulatory context, how lethal control is implemented, and whether hunting is allowed, can actually impact the effectiveness of these tools, like range riding and flattery. And when there's no lethal control option available, managers can get pulled into the trap of keeping flattery up for more than two to three months, which can habituate wolves to its presence. So without that tool, producers end up out in the middle of the night with their cattle trying to protect them from wolves. In the next episode, we'll talk more about how researchers and producers are teaming up to put new tools in the toolbox. Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, Western Sayre, and listeners like you. Today's episode was directed and edited by Zach Altman and produced by Matthew Collins, Zach Altman, 
Alex Few, Jared Beaver, and Abby Nelson. With editing support from Kathleen Shannon. Our hosts are Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Lewis Wirtz is our executive producer. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Don Gittleson, Nelson Shirley, Chet Robinson, Kyle Tackett, Matt Moen, and Linda Owens. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.